Hello friends, family, and fans, and welcome back to Cinemation, a series where I give spoiler-free reviews on western theatrical animated movies that are released throughout the year. I am your host, Big Ant, and today we're taking a look at Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the long-awaited sequel to the critically acclaimed film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is referred to by many to be one of, if not the greatest animated movie of all time, and for many reasons at that. Despite that, however, I did not end up seeing the film until a week before the sequel when I picked up a Blu-ray copy at my local Target. After watching it for the first time, I totally understand all of the hype surrounding this movie, with all the amazing soundtrack, characters, voice acting, references that work perfectly, and best of all, the animation. All of these aspects really made me excited to go and watch Across the Spider-Verse, which I could not see right away, unfortunately, due to having a very busy schedule with responsibilities and with life and stuff. However, last week, I finally found some free time and spent three hours in the theater watching this movie. And now the real question is, were those three hours of me sitting in a movie theater worth it? Let's web-sling into action and find out. Because it is a sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is an expansion on the story of the original film in terms of characters and world building. The plot revolves around Miles Morales, voiced by Shemike Moore, who has now adapted into being the Spider-Man of his universe. Of course, that privilege does not come without some downsides, as his parents worry about his well-being including his grades and absence at family events. Eventually, he reunites with Gwen Stacy, voiced by Haley Steinfeld, who takes him on a trip to other universes, and also introduces him to the ruler of all the Spider-Verses, Miguel O'Hara, voiced by voiced by Oscar Isaac, who wants Miles to follow a canon event, meaning that he has to follow a story he is assigned to, even if that means losing his loved ones. This leads Miles clashing with other spider people, and ultimately leads him on a journey for him to redefine what being Spider-Man truly means. To start with, this film greatly expands the character of the lead role Miles Morales, Whereas in the last film, Miles was written to be struggling with accepting that he is the new Spider-Man, and we saw him go through a life-changing journey to grow into that new lifestyle. Now that that is implemented into his life, we get to see him face a new conflict that comes with the privilege, including balancing his life between being a hero and maintaining his personal life with school and trying to maintain his relationship with people such as his parents. As we saw in the last movie, Miles' parents were characterized as caring while making sure Miles stays out of trouble. In this movie, we see their more strict side, especially when it comes to their son's grades and presence during important events. This creates tension in the relationship with Miles and his parents very well, because the audience sees two perspectives that are very easy to understand. For example, you understand why Miles struggles because his life is a balancing act now, and he has to keep his identity a secret, meaning that he can't tell anyone including his parents, which increase their suspicion and concern for their son's well-being. Aside from that, we also get more of an insight into Miles' personality when he is in locations such as the multiverse and when he interacts with other characters like Gwen, Peter, and Miguel. We get to see Miles as more of an independent person, where he wants to be his own Spider-Man and not follow a story people say he needs to follow. His personal views really give us more layers on his character, and they impact his relationship with characters from the last movie such as Gwen and Peter. Speaking of those characters, I also really like how this movie has two main characters. Yes, Miles is still a main character in this movie, but this movie also decides to give the spotlight to Gwen Stacy, which was a really great decision. In the last movie, Gwen was a huge supporting character, but she really didn't show up till like half an hour into the movie. In this sequel, Gwen is treated as a main character along with Miles, as we get to see her entire background, which include events that tie into what was established about her in the first movie, including her backstory and how much of an impact it truly has on her life, which leads to a lot of emotional moments where you can emphasize with her character and making her friendship with Miles 
all the more important to her. Peter returning is also a very nice touch, because we get to see him have more interactions with Miles, especially since he was a massive contributing factor to who the latter is now. So far, the older characters still retain their original charm and are expanded upon greatly, but how are the new characters? Well, I'm glad to say that the new characters in this movie are great. To start with, there are new characters from new universes, which I will touch on in a bit, but let's start with the good and work our way up to the great. First off, I like Jess Drew and her relationship with Gwen. I really like how she takes her job very seriously and how much of an impact it has on Gwen's character as a whole. I also really like some of the more comedic characters like Spider-Man India, who has a name I can't pronounce correctly, but I will put up on screen anyways. So there you go. I also really like Spider-Punk, aka Hobby Brown, as he has an awesome personality and design which I will touch up on when we get to the presentation. However, the biggest show stealers for me had to be the villains. Miguel O'Hara is a very well-written antagonist with a very detailed backstory that sort of relates to Kingpin from the last movie, and his motivations are very easy to understand. Plus, I love his interactions with Miles and how their differences lead to a very action-packed fight scene that was incredible to watch. And there is also this villain called The Spot, who ironically is my favorite character in the movie. I love how he is a mixture between goofy and threatening, kind of like Bowser in the recent Mario movie. I love his backstory which explained that his motivation was because of a certain breakfast food, and his performance by Jason Schwartzman really tops it all off. He's like the Bill Cipher of Spider-Man, and I absolutely love it. Now, I want to briefly address the biggest criticism some people have with this movie, and that is how it ends. Now, this isn't a spoiler, but if you don't want to be disappointed, you have to know that this is a two-part sequel. This was announced before the movie's release by the film's co-writers Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, because they thought the story they wrote would be too much for one movie, so they made it a two-part sequel. That's why the conclusion will arrive next year with Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, and I can understand if anyone is still disappointed by the ending, but as for me, I never left the theater so shocked before in my life. I'm not joking when I say that I have never been more excited for another entry in a franchise more than I am right now. So far the writing of this movie seems to be perfect, with every recurring and new character being incredibly memorable, and everything tying in nicely. With how well written this movie was, waiting for the next part is going to be quite a thrill ride. If you think that the writing was perfect, it only gets better from here. If there is one thing that everyone loves about Into the Spider-Verse, it's easily the animation, as this style was easily one of the most unique of its kind, and has influenced the style of other animated movies that would come after, such as The Mitchells vs. The Machines and Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Throughout the years, most sequels have always had one great aspect, and that is improved visuals over the last century, and Across the Spider-Verse is no exception to that trend. In fact, the animation in Across the Spider-Verse basically takes the visuals that were already perfect and cranks them up to 11. I am not joking, if you watch the first movie and the sequel side by side, you will notice a massive step up in quality. Not only does the frame dropping animation still look jaw dropping as ever, but they dabble in so many more styles such as live action, Lego which fun fact was actually animated by a 14 year old, so that's new, and don't even get me started on spider punk. Seriously, I can, I can only imagine how much time it took to perfect every move of this character. Another great aspect of the visuals is how much detail is put into the background, because depending on the tone of the scene, the background will always change depending on that tone, and that just screams dedication. This is even more mind-blowing when you realize that Spider-Man is a franchise that has been around since the 1960s, meaning that he has been around for almost 60 years, and just like Mario, viewing the franchise era by era through comics, 
cartoons, live action, and artwork really make you appreciate how much care was put into designing everything for every project during each era. And because this movie is based off a huge franchise like this, there are a ton of easter eggs as well, such as cameos from live action Spider-Mans, the Spider-Man from the most recent video games, many guest star appearances which I did not expect at all, and many more. The best thing about them is that they don't interrupt the flow of the plot and are actually shown at appropriate times. <coughs> The animation isn't the only thing Spider-Verse is known for, as the soundtrack in the first as the soundtrack in the first movie is often referred to as the best soundtrack in any animated feature, and I can definitely understand why. While the soundtrack in Spider-Verse 1 is spectacular, I had a minor issue with it, and that's the fact that in some scenes when it would try to get the audience emotionally invested, there would be an unfitting song playing that would practically ruin the emotion of the scene. That was really my only issue with the first movie as a whole, so thank god they learned from that mistake and fixed that in the sequel. In every scene of the movie, they know which is the correct song to play for each one. For example, when there is an action scene, exciting music plays, making you anticipate what comes next. When there is an emotional scene, emotional music plays, and not some sort of unfitting song. Overall, the presentation in Across the Spider-Verse is perfect in terms of animation and soundtrack, as both feel like a massive step up from the last movie, even going as far as to fix the one issue I had with the first movie in terms of the soundtrack, which could make it clear on which movie I like more, but the, before I determine that, we do have one more factor of the movie to talk about, and that is the voice acting. For this sequel, most of the cast from Into the Spider-Verse return in this movie and still do their roles great justice. These include Shemike Moore as Miles Morales, Haley Steinfeld as Gwen Stacy, Jake Johnson as Peter, Brian Tyree Henry as Mr. Morales, and Luna Lauren Velez as Mrs. Morales. We also get some great new performances from actors such as Issa Rae as Jess Drew, Karen Sony as Spider-Man India, Dani Kaluuya as Spider-Punk, and Oscar Isaac as Miguel O'Hara are all great performances, as they make their roles sound authentic and build to how well written each character already is. However, the award for best performance in my opinion has to go to Jason Schwartzman as a spot, as he does a fantastic job giving the character a mixture vibe, a sort of both comedic and threatening that gives him so much personality and really adds charm to the character almost like Jack Black as Bowser in the recent Mario movie, who is also my favorite performance in that movie. Overall, the cast for Across the Spider-Verse is perfect, with the recurring cast doing a perfect job in their respective roles, and the new cast can apply to that as well, especially Jason. Hmm, I wonder if he likes bagels. <laughs> Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is one of those sequels that takes a near-perfect movie and makes it beyond perfect, kind of like the sequels to animated movies like Toy Story and Shrek. All the little issues I had with the first movie are fixed and every single aspect I loved about it was cranked up to 11 in this sequel, and if you're not happy with the way it ends, you have to remember that this is a two-part sequel, and the second half is set to be released next year. And once again, I cannot stop thinking about how good it will most likely be. I don't think I have ever been more excited for a movie in my life. As for my final score on part 1, I want to give it a high score, but unfortunately, I can only give it a 10 out of 10. I think it is safe to say that this is one of the greatest animated movies of all time, and probably the greatest sequel to a movie of its kind. If you have not seen this movie, waste no time and watch it immediately. If you already have seen it, go back and watch it again. I am not joking when I say that this movie deserves to earn as much if not more than the Super Mario Bros. movie, which is currently at $1.3 billion at the box office, and if we can get Spider-Man to reach that height, that would be fantastic. Hashtag Spider-Man Sweep. 
In fact, when I go to the theater to watch the next animated movie, I think I'm going to give Spider-Verse 2 another round. Speaking of, let's look at the next movie for Cinemation. Sorry. Hmm, a new Pixar movie, and the animation looks better than ever. Well, let's just hope the story is interesting, and we don't have another box office bomb like Lightyear- oh no.